dear colleagues, we continue our new study based project, the project which is launched by the delegation of the European Union to Ukraine. And uh, now we're going to talk about the economy and economic issues, and in particular the economic crisis in the EU and the way how the EU institutions are tackling. So it's the global financial crisis, of course, and we reflect how the way how the EU institutions are tackling it. And I'm really happy and glad to introduce to you Mr. José Lambuton, who is working for, who came to Ukraine one month ago, and who is an expert in economic and trade issues, who is working now uh, on trade issues at the delegation of the European Union to Ukraine, but also uh, teaches at Sciences Po, which is one of the best uh, uh, French universities focused on politics, economics, and other issues. So, José Lam, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. So, I'm Jocelyn Guiton. Uh, indeed, I work at the delegation of the European Union in Ukraine in the trade and economic section. Um, so today I will first talk to you about the, the, the crisis of the Eurozone, uh, what we have tried to do in the Europe to tackle it, uh, is it working is it, or not, what are the next challenges uh, that we have to face. And then afterwards we'll talk about trade policy and the way we manage trade policy in the European Union. Uh, first of all, if you have questions anytime, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask. Uh, let's make it as interactive as possible. So really, uh, raise your hand uh, anytime. If it's too technical, stop me and, uh, and ask questions. So, let's start with the EU's response to global economic crisis. Maybe a first introductory comment. Uh, maybe with the first slide. What? Here is just a very, very basic picture of what happened to uh, the GDP of a number of European countries uh, and also the US starting in 2007. It's all rebased in 2007, Let's, uh, so it's all start at 100 in 2007 to, to be able to, to compare. Uh, the, it's a bit par a paradox in Europe that we have been faced with such a crisis over the past few years. In 2007, 2008, when the subprime crisis started in the US, many people in Europe were thinking, okay, that's not a crisis for us. Uh, American investment bank have done things which were, which were not, not very clever, very dangerous. Uh, we have not invested in subprime in Europe. Uh, our public finance are not that bad. We don't have twin, uh, very big deficits as in the US. And actually, the economic situation is not so bad. When you look at the economic situation in 2007 and even 2008 in Europe, that's okay. Uh, and all of a sudden, in 2008, 2009, and even more in 2010, so very suddenly, the situation deteriorates very rapidly. We discuss, uh, what, what has happened, and I will come back to this extensively, is that actually a, start, a crisis which started in the financial markets uh, and especially in the US, has, um, has revealed weaknesses which we had in Europe. We had several weaknesses in terms of public debt, in terms of public deficits, in terms of competitiveness. So far we were thinking, it's okay, it's not such a problem, uh, we will manage. And we got this big shock with the subprime crisis, and all of a sudden, these weaknesses have, be have become very obvious. I will come back to this. But so, just this, uh, to say a few more words on this, uh, on this graph, just uh, what, what I find very striking here, well, first of all, is the fact that it's not a crisis all over Europe, all, everyone is suffering the same. Very clearly, when you see this purple line, that's Greece, clearly there is one country which has very big troubles, that's Greece. Some others, Spain, Italy, Ireland, are also struggling. That's, uh, that's these countries. So it, when we look at these countries, still it, today, in 2014, 2000, uh, in 2013, and next year, the, the GDP, the, the output, the production of this country, is still lower than it was before the crisis. Uh, Germany, for instance, the GDP, uh, the, industrial pro uh, the, the industrial and services production, is already much higher. So in Europe, there is, no, there is not one 
one single message we can give about Europe. It's not as if some countries, uh, it's not as if all Europe was in a crisis right now. No, some countries are doing pretty well. Germany, Netherlands, uh, Sweden, Finland. Uh, some countries uh, are doing average, France. Some countries are doing bad, uh, Spain, Italy. Some, one country is doing very, very bad, that's Greece. So it's not a simple picture. That's, we could say many more things about this, but that's just a message I want to give before we, we go more into the details. Any questions at this stage? Okay. So I will make my, uh, this, my intervention in three parts. First, I will try to explain you, in my view, what are the roots, the origin of the Euro crisis. Uh, then explain to you what we have done, uh, which kind of decision we have implemented to improve the situation. And the situation is, is better now than it was two years ago. And we are not out of the crisis, but it's a bit better. I, I will tell you more about it. And finally, uh, I will try to describe the current challenges. Uh, what, are the, what are the threats? Are there still risks? And uh, how we could make it better. Just to uh, a short introduction on the, euro, on the euro, because it's true that the crisis has affected more countries from the eurozone. So you, you know probably that there are 28 countries in the European Union. The last one is Croatia, which has joined three months ago. But only 17 countries are part of the euro. Uh, the last one is Estonia. Uh, and actually, uh, there are also some non-EU member states which are part of the Euro, well, not part of the Eurozone, but which use the Euro as a currency. Uh, Vatican, it's a small one, uh, but Kosovo, Montenegro, they officially use Euro as a currency. But well, that's another topic. So the Euro, it's a currency which has been here for uh, 14, years, 14 years now. It, uh, it was introdu introduced in 1999. And we have been using it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as coins and banknotes since uh, 2002. Uh, so it means we have only one central bank in the Eurozone, which is the European Central Bank, which is in Frankfurt. Uh, and so it means that all the monetary policy is managed centrally in Frankfurt for all, EU, uh, for all Eurozone members. For instance, UK, in the United Kingdom, they are outside of the Euro, they still have the British pound, and they have their independent monetary policy. So they are not part of the Eurozone, and they do it their way. Uh, just a few co economic comments. Uh, I, won't, I will try not to be too technical and not to spend sh too much time on this, but I think it may be useful to explain you uh, why having a single currency, uh, single, uh, just one money, uh, one, one currency for everyone, makes it a bit different. Um, let's assume you are a country with your own currency. With your, uh, let's say you are France. I'm French, so I would speak for, uh, for France. You are France in 1995. You have the, fr the French franc. Uh, you have your own currency. What happens if you're doing budgetary deficit? If the, if the state spends much more than uh, it receives from taxpayers. Then it will spend lots of money, it will import probably. It uh, so it means that there will be, uh, the, the outcome of this will be probably, usually what we observe, is that the, the exchange rate will decrease because you will need to buy goods uh, from outside of France. You will sell from, uh, on the financial markets to buy dollars, to buy British pounds, Dutch mark, and so on. So the franc will, uh, will decline. And so the, the budget deficit will be a bit compensated at some point by a deterioration in exchange rate. Right. That's a bit technical, but that's usually, uh, well, I won't spend too much time on this. If you are in a monetary union, if you are Spain today, for instance, if you are running a large budgetary deficit, if the state spends much more than the taxpayers give to the state budget. What happens? You don't have this mechanism of rebalancing of the budget through a deterioration in the exchange rate. Why? Because your exchange rate is fixed. 
the, the exchange rate between the Spanish currency and the German currency is fixed because it's the same currency, it's the euro. So it means that uh, if the state spend spends too much money, then it will, it, it will have an effect on its neighbors. It will create higher demand, higher inflation in the whole area. And uh, we want to avoid inflation uh, for many reasons. And the key role of the central bank, of the central bank in Frankfurt, is to avoid inflation, to have very limited inflation. So it means that if one country uh, does not uh, behave in a logical way, economically speaking, spends too much, uh, then it will create inflation for the whole area, which, is, uh, which we don't want. We don't, it means that one single country can have a negative impact on the whole area. And this is why uh, we have created, at the same time as we have created the euro, budgetary rules. Uh, maybe you've heard that in Europe, normally, uh, member states, France, Germany, Slovakia, uh, Estonia, uh, must have an almost balanced budget. They, they, they are not allowed to spend much more than they receive as, uh, from the taxpayers. And uh, they must have a limited debt. That's what we call the stability and growth pact. How many of you have heard about, about this? Uh, in, in Europe, that has been the key rule, the key budget rule in the Eurozone. So we have one, cur one currency, the euro for everyone, but we have national budget. France can, uh, can, do, what, uh, can do what it wants with the state budget, uh, with the state expenditure, but they have to respect this, ru this rule to avoid what I have described previously. Is it more or less clear? More or less? Less than more? Well, basically, forget about it. Uh, just think about the fact that for 15 years we have had sort of a, sort of a budgetary constitution which was saying you, do not, you, you are not allowed to spend too much. Uh, you are saying to the government you are allowed to run a deficit but a small deficit to avoid all the nasty consequences I've described before. That was the rule. That was the way it was supposed to work. Uh, normally mem uh, member states were supposed to have limited deficit to have limited debt uh, in order to avoid a debt crisis, which is exactly what happened. Why? I would say two reasons. First of all, so SGP means this uh, stability and growth pact, so the budget rules, uh, the three percent deficit budget rules. Um, wha wha what has happened in Europe over the past 10 years and why uh, where are European countries in use the Eurozone so weak uh, why, why have they suffered so much from the crisis immediately, or very, very quickly? For two reasons. First one, uh, the rules, um, uh, this, this, uh, this deficit, this budget rules, have not been enforced. Many countries were very much in debt. When you look at the debt of Italy, for instance, uh, I'm sorry, it's in French, but it's almost the same as in English. When you look at the debt of Italy uh, before the crisis, so when, we, uh, when the economy was good, it was above 100% of the GDP. If you make a comparison in Ukraine now, I think it's like 35, 40% of GDP. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. That's more or less it? Uh, no? Uh, Sorry? But that's the deficit, I guess, but the debt ratio, the debt. No, no, okay, so it's even much lower. So, 50, okay, so it, it means that before the crisis, and you know that even with this amount of debt, Ukraine has some difficulties to finance, to get money on the markets. So, before the crisis, many European countries, Greece, Italy, uh, especially Greece and Italy actually, Belgium, uh, had very high debt. They were very, very much in debt. Uh, when, you, when the economy is good, it's not, it's not problematic to, to have a very, a very, a very big debt. L let's take a, even a household, even a consumer. If you have a, a big revenue, but you, uh, and you can afford to have lots of debt. It's not an issue. What becomes problematic is when you have lots of debt and very few revenues. And so, well, but before the crisis, 
countries like uh, Italy and Greece had lots of debt and they were very vulnerable, were, were very weak, I would say. Uh, at this time, we were thinking, okay, we will manage. Uh, but that's, we have seen what has happened afterwards. And well, yeah, it's a bit technical as well, but that the rates, the interest rates, these countries were paying on the market. Something very surprising happened um, just after the introduction of the euro. Uh, so here it's uh, 2000, and here's the beginning of the crisis. All countries which were in the eurozone started to pay very low interest rates. Uh, to, uh, they were borrowing money on the financial markets for very low interest rates, 2 3%, which is negligible. Uh, today, Ukraine pays around 10% on its debt. So 2 3%, it's extremely low. Because everyone was thinking, OK, now you are in the Eurozone. Life will be easy. Uh, we can lend you money very, very easily, which is always good to have money, to have cheap money. But what happened is that many countries thought, OK, I have cheap money. I can invest. I can, I can pay my, my uh, civil servant much more. So instead of investing in a clever uh, in investment, they started spending uh, in a nonsense way. Um, so that actually worsened the, worsened the situation. But well, let's come back to the big picture. What, uh, what was the situation in 2007 before the crisis hit? So I've just said budgetary weaknesses. Some countries were already were already very much in debt, were having big deficits. And second, many countries were not very competitive. OK, you, all know, you probably all know that in Europe, we have some countries which are very competitive. The most famous one is Germany, of course. Everyone wants to buy German cars because they're probably the best. Uh, everyone wants to, uh, uh, Chinese factories are full of a, German, uh, of a main in Germany uh, instruments because they are the most reliable. So some countries in Europe are very competitive. Uh, France uh, is, and is, is manufacturing the Airbus, probably one of the, with Boeing, one of the strongest brands uh, in the world. But some other uh, countries are not very competitive. And uh, typically, these were the countries from the south. Uh, Portugal, uh, Greece, again, uh, Spain, and you can see that these countries had very big trade deficit. They were uh, selling less than they were buying from outside. So they, they had what, uh, what we call a, tra a, ba a deficit in the, trend ba in the trade balance. They were not able to sell a lot of product outside. They were not competitive enough. So with competitiveness, it's something which is always very difficult to measure. Uh, it's difficult to say, uh, look, for instance, the US, they have a, big, a very big trade deficit. But why? Are they non-competitive? Why, in your view, <coughs> do the US have a big trade deficit? Any idea? Politics. Sorry? Politics. Why the US, the United States, they have a, a very large trade deficit? They, uh, they buy more goods exactly. and, uh, Exactly. The US, they are a very competitive country, but still they have, uh, you have Microsoft, Apple, uh, all these very, uh, Intel, all these very competitive companies, but US people buy a lot, even more than they, they produce. So that, that explains that in the US, for instance, you have a trade deficit, and still uh, it's a competitive country. In Europe, for countries from the south, that was not very much the case. Some countries, like uh, I would say Portugal or Greece, typically, they were having these big trade deficits. You can see here, minus 10, minus 15 percent, notably um, because they were not competitive. Uh, salaries were high, products were not of top quality. Uh, if, can, can you give me one Portuguese brand? <laughs> That's true, but it's usually owned by, uh, by, by, by the UK by British people. That's right. It's, uh, except Porto. <laughs> I guess if I ask you the same question with Germany. Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good export product. <laughs> and, but 
in addition, beyond football and, uh, and wine, which is a nice product, I fully agree, uh, you don't know many Portuguese or Greek brands. You know many German brands, maybe a few French, a couple of Italian ones. So these were not very competitive countries. And we are thinking, okay, that's, uh, that's life, it's not, it's not dramatic. Uh, that's what we are thinking before the crisis. Well, afterwards it became very different. So that's a bit the global picture. Yeah. That's a bit the global picture before the crisis. Uh, we were thinking, okay, we have some imbalances in Europe. Uh, some countries have too much debt, have too much deficits. So public finance are not good for all countries. But, well, we'll, ma uh, we'll manage anyway. Uh, we can, uh, m financial markets are ready to lend us money very cheaply. So we can finance our deficits. As long as, uh, some pe as, long as people are ready to lend you money at cheap cost, it's not, a big trouble. it's not a big issue to have deficits. Why is it becoming a problem in Ukraine right now? Because Ukraine has difficulties to find, uh, to find money to finance its deficit. But as long as you can get money on the financial markets, it's not an issue. So that was the first problem. Second one was we had some big uh, imbalances between countries. Some countries were becoming very competitive, uh, especially in the north of Europe. Other countries were becoming less and less competitive. When you, are, uh, when you have different currencies, it's not so much an issue. Because when, when you're, you're becoming less competitive, you can devaluate. Uh, you can let the, the money become cheaper. And then it makes you more competitive. You sell at lower prices, but it, it can re rebalance the, the situation. With a single currency, you cannot do that because German companies will sell, will sell in euros. Greek companies will sell also in euros. So the situation was becoming very difficult for uh, companies in Greece and quite easy for companies in Germany. So that was the two reasons. First of all, b uh, weak public finances weak, uh, well, too much debt, too much public deficits, and second, uh, limited competitiveness from countries in the south. You may have, may have heard the name with which we called the countries in the south, we are calling them the pigs, which is not a very, uh, not a very nice name. Uh, it, wa it was, have you heard about it already? Yes. Yeah. Which means Portugal, Italy, Ireland, uh, Greece, and Spain. And in I, I don't like the word, first of all, because it's a bit insulting, and second, because <coughs> you put in one name countries which are very much different. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to compare Ireland and to compare, Greece, and to comp uh, to compare Ireland with Greece. Ireland uh, was a country uh, where there were strong problems, especially for the banking system, but it's a very competitive country. Greece. Uh, Greece has, has all the troubles you can imagine, so it doesn't... Uh, actually, that, that's what is really unfortunate with Greece, is that all con if you take Spain, Italy, Ireland, and Portugal, each of them, they have some problems, and Greek has them, Greece has, has them all. Uh, that's really the way it is. So that's why Greece is in such a bad situation, and why there is more hope for the others. Do you have any questions at this stage? I guess it was maybe a bit complex, so... Don't hesitate. No question. <laughs> okay. So yeah, sure, of course. If we, if we take like developed countries, both US and UK, UK has a huge trade deficit, right? How, mm. how do they com compensate? What compensation do they find in their economy to compensate for this trade deficit? Well, the thing. It's not, a, it's not always a problem to have a deficit. If you be, uh, that's, with de that's the same with debt. You can have a deficit every year, but if you, uh, if you, have, if you have lots of growth, it's not an issue because if every year uh, you produce more and more, and if a small share of this additional production helps to finance the deficit, you manage. The big problem is when you, uh, you, uh, you have limited growth and deficits. So if you are a very competitive country, like the US, you can afford to have some deficit. Well, probably they have too much. Uh, I, I think the US, it's not sustainable. Uh, the UK, they, they, have lot, they have lots of problems now. Uh, but if you have lots of growth, 
It's like uh, like anyone. If you, uh, you, 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 it's not a problem to have to spend a bit more uh, to spend more than you earn. If you expect to to earn more in the coming years, if you if you think that your salary will become bigger and bigger in the next few years, then you can afford to spend a bit more, and you will you, you will repay later. The big problem starts when you stop having this uh, growth expectation. When all of a sudden you were thinking, okay. Uh, my salary will be bigger and bigger, and if all of a sudden I'm unemployed, then I have, I have big problems. If uh, my salaries become bigger, bigger, and bigger, I can afford every year to, to spend a bit more uh, than, uh, than the money I make. And for a country, it's the same. For a country which is growing very fast, everyone will be very happy to, uh, to, give, to, uh, to, give it, to give to give money to this country. But at the second where you have limited growth expectation then it becomes a mess. And that's exactly what has happened for Spain. In the mid, in 2005, that's what we were saying over lunch, uh, Spain was a country, a booming country. Everyone was saying that's a model country. Uh, investment is very high. Okay, but people were not, uh, well, well, every investment was very high, unemployment was very low, and people were thinking, okay, this country will grow forever. In 10 years, Spain will be as rich as Germany. Uh, it was a big mistake, but it's very easy to say this afterwards. But People were not seeing that investment was more in real estate, in construction, which is not the most productive investment. They were not investing in, rich, in research, in innovation. They were investing, uh, well, just in, in, uh, in building stuffs. Uh, at some point, half of the concrete used in Europe was, was used by Spain, which is nonsense. Uh, and then we have, but we have discovered that too late. So. It's not that you, 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 can, uh, you can spend more than you make, than uh, you, you earn for a long time, as long as you have growth on the other end. As, long as, as soon as growth stops, then, uh, then you have, you have some, tro some, some troubles. Yes? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, well, we both sustain our economies. I would say uh, the Federal Reserves and the European Central Bank are both spending, uh, pumping lots of money into the economy. We are printing lots of money and very low rates. I will come to this afterwards, but I can already have a word. Uh, we, what is true is that on the budget side, the US are running big deficits. The state government uh, is, buy, is, uh, is investing a lot, is buying a lot. Uh, so that's what we call Keynesian uh, inter intervention. And that's a very risky game. Uh, it's a bit like what Jap Japan is doing. Um, what the US are doing is, in my view, very risky. Actually, what the US are doing now is exactly what they were doing before the crisis. You may remember, you were very young at the time, but in 2005, 2006, uh, we had this, this, uh, this uh, we, have, we had Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve in the US, who was saying we will uh, boost the US economy by printing, printing money with very uh, relaxed monetary policy, very low rates, and it, it worked. At the time it worked because between uh, in 2005, 2006, uh, people were borrowing money to invest in more or less everything. When we look at this five or uh, six or seven years afterwards, we realize that with this very cheap money, uh, people have invested in, in subprime, have invested in, in uh, products which were very risky. So in the short term, what the US are doing is efficient. It's true that it's exactly what, when you look at this graph, now the US, they are over the, over the crisis. The, when you look at the, the GDP of the US, it's higher now, much higher now than it was in 2007 when the crisis started, 2007, 2008. But is it sustainable? Uh, you, you, you can see with the shutdown 
right now, um, it's, it's, it's not very clear. It's a very risky game because when you print money, at some point, it's very likely that you will get inflation. And that's, uh, so it's very difficult to have what we call a soft lending, uh, meaning that you, you, you print lots of money, the economy goes better, but at some point, you have to stop this. You cannot do this forever. Uh, if you do this forever, you have inflation, prices go up, and you have to print even more money to make it sustainable, so you have to stop it. So, but it's very difficult to stop. Maybe you've heard one month ago, the chairman of the, of the US Federal Reserve said, okay, now we will uh, stop a little bit to print money. And all of a sudden, everyone panicked. All around the world, the market said, oh no, the US will stop what they are doing. It's very, uh, so market, uh, during one day, financial market crashed slightly. So now the US, it works, but they are in a difficult situation. They don't know how to, how to exit the monetary policy measures they have implemented. So it's a complex, I will come back a bit to that. But what the, the US, what they are doing now, they are a bit more proactive, uh, more aggressive in their policies than Europe, that's true. But now the US have, one, uh, have over 100% of public debt, which is a lot. Uh, I don't know, I mean, we, we have to see. My view is what they are doing is very risky. But on the other end, it's true that it's a country where they they innovate more than in Europe. Uh, in the, uh, we don't have equivalent in Europe as uh, the US have in the Silicon Valley. We have some very competitive companies, but we don't have Microsoft or Apple or uh, a few others in Europe. So it's difficult to say. I'll, uh, I'll come back a bit to, to this a bit later. Yes? Uh, one time ago, uh, the money was guaranteed by uh, gold. A reserve, mm -hmm. uh, but now it's uh, rule disappeared. Um, maybe now we should uh, implement this uh, again. That's a, it's a, it's a, um, in my view, that would, not, that would be probably a good idea. The problem is that if you do so, we stopped to have the equivalence with gold 40 years ago now. Uh, it was a US president Nixon who stopped that in 1971 or 1972. Uh, if you start to have this again, it will be, alors, first of all, you would need to have an agreement with all countries. Because at the time, it was uh, the, the dollars, uh, well, it was not exactly any currency against gold, but all currencies could be exchanged with dollars, and dollars could be exchanged with gold, which, which is more or less the same. Uh, if you do that now, you need an agreement with everyone. And I don't know if you have looked at what is going on at the G20, at the big summit with all uh, presidents. Well, usually you don't manage to have anything. So well, I would say it's even more a geopolitical question than an economics question. Uh, in the sense that you need to have a risk. Uh, at the time, it was after uh, World War II, uh, it the US were very dominant, well, although there were another bloc which were having also lots of influence, but uh, it was very easy to make such a decision. Now it would be very difficult. So. But maybe what you mean is we could do it only Europe, for instance. We could say in the Eurozone, uh, we will back our currency with gold. Only the Euro. We could say uh, now uh, one Euro will be equivalent to this amount of gold. Um, I would say it's probably not what we will do for a very simple reason, is that in Europe, many people think that the Euro is too strong. So, uh, and and it makes, it's not good for our exports. And if you uh, make an equivalence between, uh, uh, usually the interest of having an equivalence between some metal, typically gold, and a currency, is to be able to have a strong currency to say, okay, it will not devaluate. If you buy this currency, you are sure of what you get. It's not paper. It's, uh, there is something behind. You see what, you, what I mean? Yeah. And uh, now, so it's a way to say, okay, we have a strong currency, and you can trust us. This is not the problem we have in Europe right now, in the sense that the euro is strong already. We would be quite happy if the euro was a bit lower. So we, would, we certainly don't want at this stage to have uh, an equivalence between euro and gold. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it would be a good solution at the global level to avoid all this imbalance, all these currency fluctuations, all this volatility on the, on the markets. But at the global level, 
I don't believe that anyone, it, it's not something which is discussed at the G G20 today, for instance. Uh, and for the euro specifically, uh, we actually we would like the euro to be a bit lower. So that's not the objective we are pursuing. Maybe in the long run, I don't know. It's, very, it's a very complex question in, terms, uh, in economics to know, uh, do you need to have flexibility with currency? Uh, or do you need to have fixed, fixed exchange rate? It's, uh, it's difficult. But now, it's not, in the, it's not the topic which is being discussed, I think. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, how do you think, is it possible to cross the crisis uh, by increasing taxes for a rich group of people? Like, I right. wanted Mr. Land to do in France. <laughs> Well, uh, we talk about my president then. Uh, honestly, uh, I don't think it's an option. Uh, wh when we look at the studies which have been made in France, typically, it was very, a very symbolic measure. It was a way to say, uh, m maybe not everyone is familiar with what uh, your, your, uh, your colleague is mentioning. In France, we have a new president for one year now. And one of the measures uh, he wanted to enforce was to say, uh, above a certain level of revenues, you will get taxed at 75%. So if you make more, it was more than 1 million euros. If you, uh, the money you make above 1 million euros, 75% uh, of this will go to the state, and you will keep only 25%. Uh, it was very much criticized for that, uh, because people were saying he's a, he's, he's a socialist, he's a communist. Uh, and in the end, uh, it, it was not really adopted. Uh, one, um, but it was very symbolic. Uh, it was a way to say we want, uh, some people have made, have made a lot of money with investment banking, uh, with speculation. And it's a bit fair that this money goes back to the state. But when you look at the amount, the, uh, there are not enough rich people. There, is, there are not enough very rich people uh, to make enough money with that. Uh, when you look uh, in France, uh, and in most European countries, the big, uh, the, the big taxes are VAT, so as of what you pay every day when you buy any product. Uh, that's typically the kind, of, uh, the, the kind of measures with which you get lots of money. Uh, if you want to tax the rich people, it, it's, it's not, first of all, it will be small amounts, and also some rich people may say, okay, I was working in Paris, now I will go to work in London, in New York, in Hong Kong, so I, I leave the country. So that, that was very controversial. And in my view, in, in terms of symbol, in, uh, in terms of, uh, it can be useful because uh, you, you need to have some cohesion in a society. It's very difficult to have a society where you have extremely rich people and poor people. So you, uh, so you want to, have, to limit the inequalities. But, in term, but to solve the crisis, uh, no, I don't think that many people were really thinking that it, you could solve the crisis with that. That's my interpretation, that's my view. Other questions? Okay, so now we, I've tried to give some elements of, on uh, the explanation of the crisis. Uh, why was Europe, uh, why has uh, the Eurozone suffer, suffered so much uh, from this crisis? I know I will describe what we've done uh, since 2009, 2010. Actually, we were taken a bit by surprise, uh, honestly. In, uh, in 2009, 2000, well, let's say we are in early 2010, economics was going a bit better. If you have a look at this. Uh, ah. ah, yeah, right, sorry. See, in 2010, it was going a bit better. We were thinking, OK, the crisis is behind us. That was tough, but this could have been worse. Le we'll manage. Uh, we, we, st we started to have some economic growth. Uh, so we were thinking, okay, uh, no need to make big changes. And all of a sudden, uh, no one, no, nobody wanted to, lo to, give, to loan money to Greece, to lend money to Greece. Uh, and all of, all of a sudden, the budgetary crisis started. So we, very clearly, we were a bit unprepared in, the Euro uh, in Europe to tackle this crisis. So we had lots of uh, what we called last chance summits with all the leaders gathering in Brussels almost every month. Uh, and every time we were having this uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, 
uh, David Cameron, uh, uh, all the big leaders saying, okay, this time we've done what it, uh, we had to do, uh, now the crisis is over. And one month after, they were still the same people, still the same place, trying to, to solve the crisis once again. So we have adopted, in my view, it's my categorization, three kinds of responses, uh, which, have, which have been big steps. Uh, it was very new for Europe, this was not foreseen at all. First thing, I w what I would call a budgetary short-term response. Uh, at the beginning of the crisis, I mean, at the budget crisis, so at the Eurozone crisis in 2010, um, we have realized that some countries would not be able to repay their debt, uh, not fully repay their debt. Nobody, nobody on the markets, no investment banks, no pension funds, no sovereign funds wanted to lend, mo to lend money to Greece, to Portugal, to Ireland. So uh, we had uh, mem the richest member states, like France, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, had to loan money directly, almost directly, to these countries. So it was a sort of a budget solidarity. Uh, and typically we have created a fund, which was called the European, uh, European Financial Stability Fund, in 2010, to loan B tens of billions of euros to Greece, to Portugal, to Ireland, uh, to Spain, uh, and for six months to, to Cyprus. So these are big, tr big transfers of money. Strictly speaking, these are, these are not uh, grants, these are, it's not given, these are loans. Uh, uh, so normally Greece will at some point repay France, Germany, Luxembourg, and so on. That's not very clear. If, uh, given the situation of Greece right now, I'm not sure that the full, the, the full money will be repaid. But we have to see. So that's, the way, that's what we've done. F first step, uh, lots of money was given, well, was uh, lended from the richest countries, those in the best shape, uh, so as I've said, France, Germany, and so on, to the poorest one, so those in the most difficult situation and notably Greece, uh, which has received lots of money. In exchange of reforms, maybe you've heard about the Troika. Uh, does it? Yes, it's really mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. It's the best or main branch in Europe, yeah? So, say it again. It's the main branch yeah, yeah. in Europe. Actually, is that so it? What do you mean? Because in Israel, I haven't found... Israel. Well, is it what we call the Troika in Europe, is uh, an organization which, which was created in exchange of that. Let me make myself clearer. We've said to Greece, okay, we we'll give you lots of money to solve your budgetary deficits, but in exchange, we'll have uh, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, who will monitor reforms. You will have to adopt reforms. You will have to fire civil servants. Uh, you will have to restructure your economy. You will have to uh, increase taxes. You will have to limit spendings, expenditures. You, uh, you will have to sell uh, as, uh, state comp state-owned companies. Uh, so, okay, we agree to give you money, but in exchange, you have, to, you have to totally restructure your economy. And this will be monitored by what we call the Troika, which is a sort of an association between the IMF, the, uh, the, the International Monetary Fund in Washington, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank. And, uh, May, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you go on uh, Google uh, Images uh, and you put Greece Troika, what you will see is many people demonstrating in Greece saying Troika out. We don't want the Troika here because they are, what they are, some people say that because of the Troika, the Greek government has to fire, uh, to sack lots of uh, civil servants, uh, has to uh, increase taxes, uh, diminish spendings, and so on. So, uh, well, in my view, they have no alternative. But uh, it's, a, it's a difficult situation for Greece now. So that's, what, that's, a, that's one of the response we have, uh, Europe has brought. Which means that now, except Greece, which has partially, um, which has not fully repaid its, its debt, uh, Greek has, partially def uh, has made a partial default, so far all, all other European countries are repaying their debt. There is no state default. Uh, the, there is no debt restructuration. So if you have uh, lended, if one of you has lended one euro to any European countries, normally you will get your, your euro back. Normally. Uh, at least so far, you will get it back. 
Any question on this? No? So that's, that's the first step. Second step, monetary short-term response. So I guess most of you probably all know the European Central Bank, uh, which I've mentioned already. Um, there is a sentence which I like very much, uh, I quote it at the end. There is a central, uh, central banker, a British one, who said, monetary policy should be boring. Monetary policy, it's people in uh, gray and uh, gray suits with uh, black ties, talking about figures uh, in, some build in some buildings, it's boring. No one wants to hear about monetary policy. Uh, it's, it's for uh, economists, it's, uh, it's really, no one wants to hear about it. You don't want, you, it, it's a very boring topic. It's not like football or, uh, or, uh, or taxes, because everyone, everyone wants to know about taxes because you pay the taxes. You don't want to, to hear about monetary policy. The, the, the rate of the central banks, who care? And the big problem, uh, 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 it's a way to see that we have problems in Europe now, is because the European Central Bank is becoming very famous. It's what the European Central Bank is doing, I would almost say, is becoming quite exciting. I don't know if you know this guy. Yeah. The one, the second one here. Does he? It's my. Sorry. Well, it's, a, it's Mario Draghi, that's the boss of the European Central Bank, and uh, now he's somewhat very famous in Europe. The previous one, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet was a bit famous in France because he was French, uh, and the previous one was a Dutch guy, everyone has forgotten. Uh, and now this guy, I, I'm pretty sure you ask uh, people in the street in France, I would say that two-thirds of the people will know him, uh, which is a lot for, a it's a, he's a technocrat, uh, he's doing very boring stuff, and now this guy has a very strong importance in Europe because the, what the, the European Central Bank has done over the past few years has, be, has been very critical. It has been very important. If the, central, if the European Central Bank has, has not been here, I'm pretty sure the euro will not exist anymore. So what has it done? Well, for those who are not familiar with monetary policy, the role of a central bank is to determine the quantity of money in the economy. You, uh, how do you do that? Uh, well, simply you are the one who prints money. Uh, no one else has, uh, can, is allowed to print money, to print banknotes. Uh, you are the only one who is allowed to do that. How do, and the, uh, how do you do that in practice? Is you determine, you, you say, here is the rate, the interest rate, at which I will loan money to commercial banks uh, at which you can get money uh, from me. So if, I'm a, so if, if I am a commercial bank, uh, like uh, here Alpha Bank or uh, Unicredit or whatever, um, you, you can go to the central bank and say, I want to have, more, I need money to loan to the consumers, to, to, uh, to corporations, to companies. And the central bank will say, okay, I can lend you at 2%, 5%, 10%, whatever. That's the role of a central bank. Uh, and as I said, in the Eurozone, you have only one central bank, the ECB, the European Central Bank. Um, what, has, uh, what has the central bank, uh, what, what has she done? Several things. At the very beginning of the crisis, so in 2007, when the subprime bubble collapsed, and in 2008, when the Lehman, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy occurred, um, the, the, the central bank, the European one, and also the Federal Reserve, which is an American central bank, uh, have, have, made, have done what we call quantitative easing. Have you heard about the name, quantitative easing? No, it's a bit technical. It, uh, it has become very popular if you read uh, the Financial Times or this kind of newspaper. It means that they have said, okay, you can have as much money as you want. Uh, we will not restrict the amount of money which is available for banks. Because what happened just after Lehman Brothers? Let's say, let's say I was a J.P. Morgan, an American bank, and he has a uh, Credit Agricole, a French bank. They were very afraid that the other would go, would go bankrupt. Uh, they were very afraid that the, the other banks next door could, uh, could disappear, just as Lehman Brothers disappeared. Uh, which means that banks were very afraid to loan to one another. So the economy was stuck. There, is what we, there was what we call a credit crunch, for those who are economists, you have probably heard of the expression. It means that everyone is afraid. No one wants to loan to one another. 
Uh, and so the economy cannot work anymore because uh, consumers, companies, need to have loans to consume, to invest, and so on. So the central, the central bank said, okay, anyone who needs money, I will loan money to him. That's what we call, basically, quantitative easing. It's almost exactly what happened uh, after 9-11. Uh, after when the two towers crashed, there was a big panic on all markets, and uh, Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the uh, US central bank, said, uh, don't worry, I will manage, Every, anyone who needs money will get money from me. So don't worry. And here, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the central bank said, anyone who needs money will get money. So that was the first step. Uh, so it means that financial markets started to work again, more or less correctly, after the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy uh, and in 2009. So that was before the Eurozone crisis itself. When the Euro Eurozone crisis started, what has the central bank done? Uh, what, what has she done? Several things. First of all, she started to do something what, which, she was not what she was, which she was not supposed to do, is to buy uh, sovereign bonds on the market. So the state debt. Uh, you, you probably know that uh, when, f uh, when Spain needs uh, money to finance its deficit, Spain will go on the market sell a paper, sell, uh, sell uh, bonds on the market and get money in exchange. And then these, these bonds are traded on, on specific markets. On, uh, stock market. Sorry? on stock market. Right? Yes. Well, it's, it's a bond market. It's not stocks. It's a bond because you commit to pay all. It's a government bond, yeah. So it's not really a stock, but it's a financial market. So it's more or less the same as a stock market. And then the central bank said, OK, I will buy this. Uh, I will, from now on, in order to, uh, what, given that it was, very, it was a very risky investment, no one wanted to buy these bonds anymore. Who want, I mean, I, I'm in 2010, who, uh, who would buy uh, Greek bonds? Because the chances to have it repaid were very limited. So the central bank went on the market and said, I will buy this. And in that, by doing that, it helped Greece, Spain, and other countries to be able still to get some money on the markets. So that, that was the first step. So the central bank played the role of an investor. It bought uh, bonds, it printed money, and then with, it, with this money, the central bank bought bonds on the market, which helped a lot. That's the interest rate which are paid by Italy. And you see that since uh, 2011, to, uh, well, since 2012, uh, interest rates are much lower now for Italy than they were a bit before. Uh, why? Because now people think, f have the impression that, okay, maybe Italy is in a difficult situation, but in the end, uh, if Italy is not able to get money on the market, then it will be able to get money at the central bank. So now people are not as afraid as they were two years ago. Um, they are not as afraid as they were to, to buy Italian, Portuguese, Greek, uh, Spanish uh, bonds uh, to Spain, to Greek, to, to Italy. Um, well, the other uh, point are a bit technical, but for people who are interested in monetary policy, it's a big shock. It's a very big thing because now it means that the European Central Bank is becoming what we call a lender of last resort. It means that when a, when a state is not able to get money on the market, it can always go at the central bank which is something uh, for many people, especially in Germany, we are very afraid of that. Uh, some people are very afraid of that because it means that at some point there is what we call a moral hazard. I don't know if you are familiar with the expression. Can anyone try to explain to me what a moral, moral hazard is? Well, it's a bit technical. It means that, uh, well, it means that if, you, if you know that at some point you will be insured, you will be able to find money at the bank, at the central bank, you, you, you feel that you are not very responsible, you may not be very responsible anymore because you think, okay, someone will always lend me money. I don't need to be very strict. I don't need to, uh, to have balanced budget. I can have some deficits. And in the end, if I have a problem, I will knock at the, at the doors of the central bank. And this guy, Mario Draghi in Frankfurt will always lend me money. And he's Italian, he knows what he, how it works. Um, well, that's what the European Central Bank has done. Any question on uh, monetary policy? 
it's a bit technical, but uh, so, so far it worked. So, uh, so I guess I have to talk, to, to talk about it. And, okay. Last thing we've done uh, in the European Union is that I've told you that uh, we had this instrument, the Stability and Growth Pact, which was not very efficient. Uh, we w n normally, member states were not allowed to have deficits, to have too much deficit, and in the end, they still had. So they didn't care much about the rules. So now the rules are much stronger, which is, which is a big step. Uh, you, you have to imagine that in Europe, uh, normally we have sovereign states, independent states. Uh, they, they can decide themselves uh, on, the, on, on their budget. So, and when, when you are, let, let's imagine you are a member of a French parliament, of the national parliament. You don't want to have, to have some, someone above you who comes and tells, no, your budget, it's not good, change it. And so far, that was the way it was working. The, commission, the, the European Union, the European Commission was saying, this budget is not good, you're spending too much, and member states, national parliament, national government were saying, okay, thank you for your advice, but we don't care. And that was, that's really the way it was working. Actually, they were saying, uh, okay, this year we don't care, but promise, next year we'll do better. And it was going on and on and, uh, every year. Now, a big change. No, not many people have noticed this in Europe. Uh, but now the European Commission will, mon will be able to adopt sanctions against member states. Uh, we, uh, member states which do not respect the rules. It means that, let's assume that France has 5% of public deficit instead of 3, uh, which is a rule. The, com the Commission can say, okay, now you will have to pay 1, 1, million, 1 billion, 2 billion euros to the European budget because of this. You will have a fine. We'll see if it works, but that's a big step. Uh, before, there were not very strong possibility to sanction, to put fines on member states. So it's a big change. We'll see if it works. Uh, normally, the idea is to make it more credible. Normally, uh, with these rules, uh, member states should be more afraid of Brussels, of the European Commission, and they, sh they should vote uh, balanced, more, uh, more balanced budget. Uh, second step, now the, commi uh, the Commission will also monitor all kinds of imbalances. Uh, not, only budget imba uh, not only budget deficit, but all kinds of imbalances. What do I mean? I've mentioned uh, the competitiveness issue. There are two states which are very typical of this problem. It's Spain and Ireland. Uh, I've, I've told you that Greece, it was a mess uh, forever. Italy, we knew there was a very high debt in Italy. But Spain, as I told you, everyone was saying it's great. Uh, it's growing fast. It's investing. Very little deficit. Ireland, it was the same. Very competitive country. Uh, Google has, put, uh, has uh, invested here, Intel, uh, limited de budget deficit. And all of a sudden, these countries really crashed. In 2008 and 2009, they really crashed in a few months because Spain has invested only in real estate, in construction. And Ireland, uh, Irish bank, has, uh, had invested everywhere in a, in a non very clever way. So it means that we were focusing too much on the budget. We are saying, OK, they have, a, uh, they have balanced budget. They don't have much public deficit. They don't have much public debt. So that's OK. And in the end, we, are, we, we have not paid enough attention to other issues, such, such as uh, competitiveness, uh, where are the investments made, and so on. So now, uh, the European Commission will monitor much closer all these kind of imbalances. So that's the free way we have tried to respond um, to the crisis. So far, it's working, more or less. In my view, what has been the most important is also maybe the, the most complex one, is what the European Central Bank has, does, has done. Very clearly, uh, things, are, things are, going, are, are, are better since the summer 2012, when uh, Mario Draghi, the guy I showed you uh, a few minutes ago, said something which uh, all markets have, have interpreted uh, in a very good way. He said, uh, we, I, what did he say exactly? He said, um, I will save the euro, whatever it takes. 
uh, it says, so this sentence, whatever it takes, you put it on Google, it will immediately find lots of, uh, lots of comments about this uh, Mario Draghi statement. Uh, because the fact that he said, whatever it takes, when you are a central bank, you can print money. Uh, you, you, there is no limit to the quantity of money you can print, by definition. You, are the, uh, you have a monopoly to print money, and you can print as much as you want. So if a central bank want, wants to save a state, wants to, uh, to avoid a uh, sovereign default, it can. It's a very risky game, and we come back to the question you had earlier today, uh, what are the consequences of what the US are doing? But it can. So, and that's what he said. He said, I will save the euro, the euro will not collapse, and I will do whatever it takes to save it. And since then, that's exactly here, you see this big decrease in interest rate. Since then, things are, things are doing better. Well. Of course, unemployment is still very high in Spain and in Greece. Growth is still low. But now there are forecasts of slightly positive growth at the end of this year and significant growth next year. So everyone is hoping for a recovery uh, now. But, and that's my, la my last part, uh, that's far from certain. So, uh, the title of my last part, which will not take long, is Challenges Ahead of Us. Uh, if you look at the comments from, the fr uh, from many politicians in Europe now, many will tell you, now we are out of the crisis. That's it. We're, we are slightly recovering from the crisis. It will take some time, but now we have entered in positive growth. So positive growth means employment, un unemployment should decrease, we will create jobs. Uh, companies should invest again, uh, stocks market should, uh, should grow, and that's it, now we are over. It has been difficult, it has been five years uh, since the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers in 2008, but now we are over it, thanks to wh all what we've done. This is, this is possibly true, but that's far from certain. So, in my view, I think there are several risks. So, I've listed five. In terms of budgetary policy, so far, as I've told you, only Greece has uh, made a, a sovereign default on its debt. Only Greece has not fully repaid its debt. Uh, but may, it's, in, it is still far from certain that all countries will be able to re fully repay their debt. Here are two graphs. On the right, uh, it's debt as a percent of GDP uh, of the economic output. Uh, in red, that's the pigs countries. On the left, that's, uh, that's the same, but in terms of quantity, not as a percent of GDP, but in terms of billion, uh, actually in terms of thousands of billion of euros. So why, uh, why do I show you these graphs? It's just because, just have a look at the countries we have helped for the moment. Ireland here, Portugal here, and Greece here. So it was easy. The countries which have been helped by their neighbors, they, are, they were small. So they were very much in debt in terms of ratio, because they were here. You see Greece, very much in debt. OK. But it was, it's a ratio. Greece, it's a small economy. So the Greek, the Greek GDP is not very, is not very big. Uh, so it was, so meaning that the total Greek debt was around 2,000, uh, 200, sorry. 200 billion euros, which is of course far from nothing, but that was manageable. What happens if Spain or Italy goes bankrupt? It's uh, here, it's a totally different situation. Because when you look at Spain, it's three times the, the Greek, the, the Spanish debt is three times the Greek debt. If you look at Italy, it, Italian, uh, Italian debt, it's more than Spanish, Greek, Portugal, Ireland debt all combined. So if in the coming months, uh, Berlusconi comes back into power and say, no, uh, I, I, I increase expenditures and I cut all taxes, then Italy could be in a very, ba in a very bad situation. Uh, if, Sp if in Spain they don't manage to curb unemployment and growth does not come back, that's, that's a, that could be a complex situation. And we move into an unknown territory in the sense uh, that, as I've said, Saving Ireland or Portugal was rather easy. Spain, it's, a, it's another issue. I would be rather optimistic.